Are you looking to invest in the Perth property market and want to use a local buyer's agent to help you secure your next investment? Mitch and Sam are the co-founders of SJR Property Group, a buyer's agency based in Perth that specialise in helping investors build property portfolios that outperform the market. Check out www.sjrpropertygroup.com.au to book in a free discovery call and chat with a local buyer's agent today. This is a Momentum Media production. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Smart Property Investment Show. I'm Grace Ormsby. And late last year, you may recall, we sat down and had a really, really good chat with the Assistant Commissioner at the ATO, Rob Thompson. And I thought we need to bring him back because there is so much that we can be talking about in the world of tax. We barely scraped the surface, really, when we were talking about holiday homes or rental properties and distinguishing between the two. So, Rob... Welcome back. Thanks. It's great to be back. Thanks so much for taking the time. I know how busy you must be, especially at this point in time where we're looking down the barrel at another tax time. I don't know where the year has gone, but as I said before, last time you were on the show, we did talk about short-term rentals and holiday homes and, and data matching work as well. And anyone who is interested, if you didn't listen to that episode or you want a refresher in the lead up to tax time, check it out, uh, holiday home or rental property, understanding the tax difference. So that was, I think, the 7th of December that we released that episode, Rob, which means we talked a little bit before then. It's been a little while. How have you been? I've been good. I've been good, Grace. We're starting to gear up for tax time 2024. Um, so, so you know, a great time to be to be speaking to you about some more stuff to do with rental property investments and things for your kind of subscribers and listeners to think about. I mean, thank you again for taking the time. As you say, it must be such a busy period for you guys trying to get everything in order, ready for the next tax time. And, and that's why I thought it would be a great time to have another conversation to really make sure people are honing in on what they need to be paying attention to this tax time. And you need to be prepared, basically, I think is the bottom line. But we've got a lot to talk about today, Rob. There's so many different topics that we could be talking about when it does come to a rental property. And Borrowing and interest expenses is another big one, as well as the difference between repairs and capital works. And these are things that people really need to be paying attention to, I think. That's right. So for property investments, look, there's definitely a few things that are on our radar and we just want people to pay attention to them this year. Most of you would have heard this already, but our audits and reviews, along with our data matching, has shown that incorrect reporting on rental property income and, and expenses is estimated to be $1.2 billion. And we're seeing nine out of 10 tax returns, there's at least one error in them. And it's probably worth pointing out, actually, that 87% of those errors are in agent-prepared returns. So probably on that last point, if you are lodging through an agent, they need to have the whole picture of your tax affairs to be able to give you accurate advice and help you to get your tax return right. So understanding the rental reporting obligations and supplying your agents with the complete records is really a, goes a long way to helping with this. That's all scary stuff, Rob. Um, I can't believe 87% of errors are coming from agent prepared returns. People are probably by the sounds of it, relying a little bit too much on on someone else to do the hard lifting for them. But I remember last time we were talking about it's down to the person who who is lodging the tax, the individual that needs to be paying attention to these things. So I'm really glad we're having this conversation today. Why is it so many errors though? Like what do you think it is? Look, nine out of 10 is obviously a large number. And we know that most of it isn't deliberate. And we know everyone's busy, right? School, work, everything else, you know, but we just want to help taxpayers to get it right the first time they lodge. And so we're hoping that we can give a few tips that will help property investors with that. That is music to my ears. And proactivity is probably going to be, what again, one of the names of the game today. What can landlords um, who are predominantly our listener base be doing to make sure they're doing the right thing? One of the most important things is to get your records into a good shape. And our website has some 
smart tax tips for investment property that can help people to understand how to get their records right for tax time. Otherwise, it's just really a matter of the landlord talking to their tax agent about the receipts and paperwork that that tax agent needs to see and moving it into a format that really works better for the tax agent. Mm -hmm. So you can ask your agent kind of if they have a spreadsheet template they use that you could use or if they have a record keeping software that's kind of compatible with their practice software, which makes it easy to transfer the data. But if you don't have evidence to support your claims, your tax agent is actually under an obligation to uh, question the claim that you're putting in. Five minutes in and already giving some amazing tips to everyone who is listening along. As we've said, it's tax time just around the corner. Make sure you are doing this stuff now. You don't want to be caught unawares or like after the fact. So Rob, one of these big areas then that we're going to be looking at is borrowing expenses because let's face it, a lot of people have been looking to refinance this last year. We've seen a lot of movement in the cash rate. So I think this is a really, really big one that's going to affect a lot of people this year particularly and something that they need to be paying attention to because it is a massive expense. Yes, it can be. So when you buy a property to rent it out, hopefully you've had a chat to either a tax agent or you've kind of had a look at our ATO website. So you kind of understand the basics. So you're not surprised around what you can and you can't claim as an immediate deduction. So there's borrowing expenses and borrowing expenses can include a number of costs when you take out the loan. So things like your loan establishment fees, your title search fees, mortgage insurance, even the, the cost of preparing and filing the documentation, the documents as well as the stamp duty that's charged on the mortgage. Now, you need to be aware that's the stamp duty charged on the mortgage, not to be confused with the state or territory stamp duty on the purchase of the property. Okay, big difference there. There is, there is one to pay attention to. So you need to spread those borrowing costs over five years or the term of the loan, whichever is less. Unless your borrowing expenses are $100 or less, in which case you can claim an automatic deduction in a year for those expenses. But let's be honest, borrowing expenses these days, going to be a very rare case that it's $100 or less. So you do need to remember to apportion or spread those costs over five years. There are also a host of things that aren't borrowing costs, but can still be claimed on other labels of your tax return. Like you talked about mortgages, so like interest paid on your mortgage. The borrowing expenses fact sheet that we have on the website in our investor toolkit can provide really good guidance on what are borrowing expenses and what aren't borrowing expenses and some really good examples around how you can calculate your borrowing expenses deductions over the five years. Probably just a a last thing to point out on this. I just wanted to mention that some expenses that you have, particularly when you first purchase the property for investment, only come into play when you actually go to sell the property. And these can be used to calculate your capital gain or your capital loss on the property. So again, good record keeping, really important from, from the start so that when you get to that point around selling that, you know, your investment property later on, you've got all your records in a good shape. Good record keeping. If people haven't been paying, haven't been taking notes rather for what Rob's been talking about so far, I recommend you rewind this and get a piece of paper and, and write this down because this is all very, very important stuff. We're going to take a quick break there. See you on the other side to hear more from Rob Thompson. Are you looking to invest for a big return, but are unsure which suburb is up and coming and guaranteed to give you the most bang for your buck? Smart Property Investment and Pure Property Investment have unveiled the Fast 50 report for 2025, identifying the suburbs backed by research that are giving investors the highest returns. Don't make any investing decisions until you read the free report. Visit smartpropertyinvestment.com.au to download the report. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to this episode of the Smart Property Investment Show. I am joined by the Assistant Commissioner at the ATO, Rob Thompson. Rob, before the break, you were talking all about borrowing expenses, and I advised everyone to be taking notes. Record keeping is obviously a must here, but it's not the only expense that people are going to be looking at come tax time. And interest expenses, as we brought up earlier, is another really, really big one. And Oftentimes, it is the biggest expense for property investors. What do people need to know about this part? So, 
So obviously, when when you have a rental property, as you've said, odds on is you've got a loan or a mortgage for that rental property. And as you said, for a lot of our investors, it is their biggest expense. So a real focus for us at the ATO is to help investors understand what interest they can claim for their mortgage. So earlier, I noted the tax gap for rental properties, which is estimated to be around $1.2 billion. And the tax gap is essentially an estimate of the difference between the amount of tax that the ATO collects and what we would have collected if every taxpayer had lodged correctly. So incorrect reporting for interest expenses accounts for 42% of the tax gap for rental properties of that $1.2 wow. billion. Yeah, it's a big number. And interest paid is immediately deductible, but only if the interest is for the rental property. If you're looking to refinance or you're looking to withdraw from your investment property and you're using to use part of that money for personal items like cars, pay for school fees, go on a holiday, you do need to be aware that if the loan is for 25 years, then you need to apportion the personal component of that over the remaining life of the loan. This can even be, you know, you talked about refinancing of of loans earlier. This can even be where you refinance Mm. the loan. So look, we're not saying you can't do this, you know, your personal choices to what you do, but you need to be aware of your tax obligations before making these decisions. And like to put that as an example, you know, you can't just pay back the private portion of your loan and then claim all the interest as deductible on the loan. So say you've got to take it out a loan for an investment property, but you've also used 25,000 of that for personal use. You can't just kind of pay back the first 25 grand of the loan and say, okay, I'm good. The rest relates to the investment property. So every payment must be apportioned between the private and the investment components. And those calculations can be complex as time goes on. If you have already redrawn funds from your investment loan and you've used it for private purposes, we've got another fact sheet in the investor toolkit around interest expenses that really can help you to apportion your interest to avoid claiming incorrectly. Plenty of information out there to be helping taxpayers along this journey, which again, we go through every single year, tax time. So make sure you're getting your affairs in order now ahead of time. I'd like to say, Rob, that this is all common sense, but it's clearly not if you've got a $1.2 billion gap going on. And we've just talked about apportioning. What are some of the other things that people do need to be really, really aware of? Yeah, so, you know, Grace, as we said at the start, we think it's just a lot of people that are busy and make mistakes. And so one thing where we do hear people make mistakes, you know, we hear it in cafes, we hear it in public transport, we hear people saying, well, you know, my partner earns less than me. So we're putting all the income and all the tax in there now. And we've seen this in tax return too. So when we do the data matching, we can see that this has been confirmed. And what's important to remember here is it's the title deeds that actually outline your legal interest that you have in the property. And you have to declare your rental income and claim your expenses according to the legal ownership Regardless of you know who earns more or less, you know you have to be looking to the title deeds and legal ownership in looking at the apportionment of income and expenses between more than two people. So joint tenants are kind of own the property jointly, and so the income and deductions need to be equally split. So that's kind of like your mum and dad investors. Mm-hmm. There's also then things another called tenants in common. And they may actually have unequal legal ownership interests in the property. So the income and deductions then need to be declared and claimed according to the legal ownership that each individual has in the property. So, you know, you could have three people, one has 50%, two have 25 Then you need to split the income and the expenses along that those lines. I can see how this all does get quite complicated, but it also makes sense. It's very clear there how people should be structuring it. And I'm guessing the the earlier on this is all worked out, the easier it makes it down the track when you're looking at all these things each year as well. Moving on now, Rob, to repairs and capital works. And I understand that that is something that does get misclassified a lot. What are you seeing in this space? What are the things that people need to pay attention to? 
So very true, Grace. We continue to see this as an issue that comes up again and again as an area where people are just making mistakes and probably not understanding the difference between really when something's a repair and when something's an improvement. And a lot of this comes down to when you're repairing something, you need to think about, is it just a repair or are you actually improving it? And so maybe a, a simple example, right? If you've got an old timber window in your house and you've, you know, damaged a pane of glass in the window, are you just having the glass in the window replaced? Because that's a repair. Mm-hmm. Or are you actually deciding, well, actually, you know what, we're going to rip out that old window. We're going to put in a new window, double glazing, a lot better for insulation, a lot better for noise, and it's going to last longer. In that case, it's no longer a repair. It falls under what we call capital works. Okay. So quick one here, actually. If someone is repairing, say their bathroom, they've got paint like peeling off the walls, there's there's cracked tiles on the floor. How do you classify that one? Good question. And this is like an area where we think your we expect your tax agents are going to start to ask you some questions and you might want to look on the information on our website to figure out is this a repair or is or is this, you know, a capital works. But if we kind of look at each component around what you just mentioned. So the question is, are you repainting the painted areas, you know, where the, the paint's peeling off? If so, that's maintenance and it can be claimed straight away. But if you decided, you know what, I'm just going to tile the walls instead, I think that's better, then that's an improvement. So that's a capital work. And so if you think about the tiles, are you replacing or sealing the cracked tiles on the floor? Then that would be the repair. Or you're actually going, you know what, I'm going to remove all those tiles and retile the whole floor with new tiles. Then that's an improvement. So it's a capital works. So basically, improvements are things that go beyond essentially restoring the basic functionality of the property rather than fixing damage or wear and tear that kind of arises when you rent out a property. Mm -hmm. So you need to stop really and think about that each thing in your property, is it a repair, is it a capital works, so it's claimed correctly. And our repairs, maintenance and capital works fact sheet in the Investor Toolkit has a quick reference guide that kind of goes into a lot of good detail and can help you to understand this point. What I'm getting from this, Rob, is that you need to be breaking down every single thing into its separate parts, like ingredients in a recipe. That's probably not the best analogy there, but... It's not a a bad analogy, actually. And and I think to that, that's why records are really important, right? Because you're going to need to be able to show for each of those repairs, is it a repair and you can claim it straight away? Is it a capital work? You need to claim that over time. You know, and having good records helps you to be able to, to understand what you can claim immediately, what you can claim over a longer period of time, and, and helps your tax agent to kind of for you to get your tax return right. Again, to everyone listening, record keeping is the, right. the name of the day, the theme, the key thing we are trying to get across here. Um, I'm going to up the complexity perhaps a little bit here, Rob. I've got a question around strata arrangements and, and what does it mean for properties, investment properties, when they are part of one? Because they're confusing enough for a lot of people in themselves. No, it's a good point. So, so body corporate freeze, you know, general purpose or special purpose funds, where they include amount for capital works, improvements or repairs, are actually capital in nature and aren't immediately deductible. So these are things to consider when you have a strata unit or an apartment as a rental? Hmm, I guess it's not even actually as complicated as as I was thinking. But again, record keeping, making sure you know what all these things are labelled under because I can very much see that every situation will will be different and will result in a different outcome here. So I've got a question as well, Rob, around those initial repairs because I feel like the word repair is probably not the right word to be using because that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to fall into that category. You know, it's 100% correct, Grace, but there is a major difference. When you buy a property and you're getting it ready for tenants, so really anything you do then doesn't really fall under the repair category. This is because the damage or defect wasn't caused by the tenants in the property. Mm -hmm. So we see deductions in the first year of ownership that are far higher than subsequent years as you prepare the property for rent, where those costs have been incorrectly claimed. 
as an immediate deduction. If the defect, the damage or the deterioration in the property existed at the time you purchased the property, it will be an initial repair. Even if you don't repair it straight away or you don't know the issue until a later date. So if you're making the property suitable to rent out, initial repairs right, are all capital in nature and aren't deductible immediately. So keeping good records, once again, records, 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 but keeping good records and is is really important. And these are both important, you know, in working out your tax return, but they're also re- important when you go to sell the property and you're working out your capital gain or loss on the property. One last thing to ask you before the break, Rob, because we're gonna this is the last question I've got around that capital works stuff. How do people go about claiming that when it does come to tax time? So regardless of whether Capital Works are initial repairs or renovating, it's really the same. And Capital Works are usually claimed at a rate of 2.5% over 40 years once the work's been completed. Any costs associated with improving your property are factored into your capital gains tax calculation when you sell, minus the amount that you've already claimed as a Capital Works. And this is another reason, as I said before, why good records are really important because you need to be able to show, you know, when you go to sell, how much you've already claimed as a capital works and what's left over that you can put into your cost base in calculating your capital gain or loss. Mm. To everyone who is listening along, again, if you have not got a piece of paper and a pen out or a laptop and you're furiously typing notes, you need to go back to the beginning of this episode and start again, because there is some absolute gold in here coming from the Assistant Commissioner at the ATO, Rob Thompson. See you on the other side of the break. G'day listeners, Sammy Gordon here from Australian Property Scout. If you're loving all the property investment content over here at SBI, you will love the Scouting Australia podcast. Hosted by myself, alongside my good mate and experienced investor, Jimmy Ibrahim, we unpack everything from real investor stories, mindset hacks, and a massive amount of property investment strategies and much, much more. Check us out over at the Scouting Australia podcast and take your investing to a new level. Hey everyone, welcome back to this episode of the Smart Property Investment Show. We are joined by Rob Thompson from the ATO and Rob has been giving us such a good insight into the things that people need to be paying attention to when it comes to their investment property at tax time. And Rob, I feel like this section of the show is going to be absolutely no different because capital allowances is another big topic that I, I'd love to pick your brains on and they're pretty much depreciating assets there are a lot of these within investment properties that people need to be paying attention to and keeping track of as they go. Can you shed some light on on how you approach capital allowances from the tax perspective? So from a tax perspective, like every kind of thing, smoke alarms, range hoods, air conditioners, pool pumps, and other appliances kind of to window coverings, all can be capital can, you know, you need to think about capital allowances for all them. They can be depreciating assets. And basically, every asset has an effect of life. And this is the period of time that something is reasonably expected to last. So you need to claim the decline in value over the depreciating assets' effect of life. And that can be different for each asset, right? But if an asset is also older than its effective life, then you can't claim a deduction for declining value for that asset anymore. Some people think that if you're replacing something, it's an immediate write-off, but that's only true if the item costs $300 or less. Right? It's also worth noting, and um, this is when dates become important. Um, write it down. Write it down. If you purchase the residential rental property after the 9th of May 2017, you can't claim a deduction for declining value of any second-hand depreciating assets. And this includes items that are in the property when you bought it or in your home when you then decided that you're going to rent that property out. Mm -hmm. This doesn't apply to, to newly built properties or properties that have been substantially renovated. And to kind of give you an idea, Grace, around what substantially renovated looks like, we're really talking about where most of the building 
has been rebuilt or replaced. So, you know, as we've talked about for records, 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 the bottom line is it's really good to have a depreciation schedule, even if it's just a spreadsheet, to help you kind of be able to track these. But often, you know, a quantity surveyor is brought in to prepare a report. So before you're engaging a quantity surveyor, see what level of detail you're going to get in that report. The more thorough it is, the more likely that you'll be able to claim once again, you know, our rental repairs fact sheet and our investor toolkit has some really good information on depreciating assets that can kind of help you to understand this issue in a, in a bit more detail. So much in that investor toolkit. Um, you guys really have, I mean, I guess when you're dealing with every single taxpayer across the country, you're going to need to have some resources there to help people out because it is confusing, especially when you are bringing in things like investment properties like we're talking about today. Um, reporting income, I feel like, is an area where people get often get stuck, Rob, correct me if I'm wrong there, but what are some of the, the things that people need to be thinking about when it comes to that? Definitely. Entering rental income on the tax return is an area where we see people get it wrong. So a few quick tips there. If you have a property manager, check your end of year statements and ask questions if it's not clear, if you're not sure about something. Mm -hmm. But, you know, two quick tips. Ensure that you include the gross rent on your tax return. So that's the amount before any expenses may have been taken out. And then you can claim the expenses separately at the right labels in your tax return. We see tax returns lodged with a net amount being entered kind of at the income label. So we know that that's your gross, you know, and they've taken the deductions out. But then we also see those deductions being claimed somewhere else in the tax return. So, you know, they literally they're double dipping on the deduction. And that's, you know, something that you can't do. That all income does need to be included in the tax return as well. So, you know, that includes insurance payouts or any bond money that's been retained to cover fixing any damage that's been caused by tenants or kind of any insured events that occurred when the property was being rented. Good to know. And I feel like we've mentioned property managers now. We've talked about quantity surveyors and then we've also talked about the tax agents. And it's clear why you need to make sure that you have a team around you that is just as good at record keeping as you are. I think that's probably another aspect we can bring in there that other people that you are working with should also have good record keeping. And and if they don't, they're probably not the best kind of people to be working with. And that's not any kind of official advice there, but just food for thought for people, especially at tax time when you're trying to pull all this information together. You want to make it as easy as possible on yourself. Rob, talking about bond money, that's obviously probably a pretty big area, especially I know that the the data matching program has been in effect for a little while now, but there's some updates, I believe, to it. Yes. So we've been acquiring rental property data, rental bond data for a number of years now, and we've just extended that program to 2026. And we kind of use that data to identify where there might be income producing properties. But actually, that's not the only data we get. We also get a range of other data that relates to investment properties. We get property transfer data, which records the purchase and sale of Australian property. We get transaction data from short-term accommodation providers, you know, like your Airbnbs. We get property manager data. We get residential investment property loan data which is essentially the data from financial institutions that includes the interest and the borrowing expenses. And we also get landlord insurance data. So we get a lot of data, right? Mm -hmm. And this builds a really good picture of, of investors and helps us to kind of identify where perhaps people have got it wrong in their reporting. And for us, it's not a ha-ha, gotcha moment we're after. We're not after that at all. We're just trying to help investors to get it right. And, you know, this is why we provide lots of guidance on our website so people can get it right the first time when they lodge. Some really good insights there. And that's been a lot of information, Rob. Um, As I said to everyone, you know, taking notes, there is a lot of information to unpack here. Go back, have another listen, make sure you've, you've got all your bases covered when it does come to these things. But we've mentioned it a lot already today, but I before you do go, I want to get it one more time, um, how investors can actually seek out 
more guidance, more help, more assistance in this area if they do have questions, which they, they probably do. So I think I've mentioned the Investor Toolkit um, a number of times. It's got lots of good um, fact sheets, practical help, and more tips, which we kind of haven't covered today. So it's definitely a good resource. But you can find that at ato.gov.au forward slash Investor Toolkit. We also have a series of rental videos that have useful information for property investors, and you can find those at ato.gov.au forward slash rental videos. You can also speak to a registered tax agent. You know, that they can they can help you work out in this space what you can and cannot claim. But remember, it really comes down to having good records to back up your claims and giving a complete and correct information to your registered tax agent if you use one. So ultimately, even if you use a property manager, if you lodge through it or you lodge through a tax agent or both, it's still your responsibility to ensure your tax return is correct and complies with the tax law. A very, very important note to make to round out this episode. Rob, thank you so much for taking the time. Again, I know how busy you are, so we'd really, really do appreciate being able to get this kind of information straight from the horse's mouth to, to our investor base. Thank you again. It's always lovely to chat. Thanks, Grace. Always a pleasure. Already looking forward to the next one. If anyone listening along has enjoyed this episode, like or review us on whatever platform that you do listen to your podcasts on. If you have any questions, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. As always, stay up to date with all the latest on our website and check us out on social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Until next episode, stay safe and well wherever you are listening from. Bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. trapped by rising interest payments? Escape from mortgage prison with expert refinancing assistance from Finney. We have helped hundreds of borrowers break free from higher loan repayments by finding a more suitable loan. Our expert team can quickly assess your situation and if there's a better lender available, we'll find it fast. Don't delay. Call today. Speak to a Finney mortgage specialist on 02 8866 or visit our website at www.finney.com.au.